Now it's time for the Brush Street Beat, everybody. We're going to talk a little Tigers baseball, and joining us to do so is a Michigan native and now MLB insider, John Morosi. John, we're going to be testing your Detroit knowledge here, and I know you've got to be pretty excited to talk some Detroit sports today. <laughs> I certainly am, Daniela and Art. Uh, great to be with you uh, and great to have this show going to keep us all connected, whether it's Tigers or Wings, certainly two teams that have been a big part of my life growing up in Michigan and living here now. So uh, great to be with you today. Let's talk about the Tigers first off, John. You mentioned kind of the state that they're in right now. A bad season last year, but hey, they've got the first round, or I'm sorry, the first overall pick again in this coming draft. And they've also got some great prospects in the system right now. Just kind of briefly, what is your outlook on what the 2020 season will look like for the Tigers? Well, Danielle, it's a great question. And, and certainly uh, the, the length of it uh, could determine who we see at the major league level. And by that, I mean, uh, I think when things were looking like they were going to be on schedule from a standpoint of a, a usual six-month regular season. You could have projected out, well, maybe Casey Mize comes in in the second half at some point in time, and, and does Manning arrive this, this year as well? I think the, the way that the season is playing out potentially could compress uh, the amount of opportunity that we're going to see for pitchers to, to reach the major leagues this season. But I, I do think we're going to start to see some of that group of prospects that we've heard so much about start to arrive to Detroit uh, at some point in time during the course of the season, again, provided that we see a four-month regular season, whatever it might end up being. But I think in general, the, the, the farm system right now, Daniela and Art, is in the best shape that I can recall it being since 2006, since you saw Verlander and Zamaya arrive and help the Tigers uh, win the pennant that year. It, this is the best we have seen it since then. Uh, one more number one overall pick to come, as you mentioned. So the farm system right now is good, maybe even very good, and getting better, I think, here in the next several months. Uh, JP, do you have a feel where the Tigers might go with that first-round pick? I mean, I'm all about Spencer uh, 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 Torkelson, and, but, you know, I know that they, they like Austin Martin, too, but I don't know how you can pass up a guy like Torkelson who is, has those power numbers, big hitting first baseman. Cabrera now is basically the designated hitter. I mean, that is the guy, if I were drafting, I would go with, but uh, do you have a feel either way? I concur with that, Art. I would say if I had to predict today that Torkelson is going to be the first overall pick, and uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, as you mentioned, it's a power bat out of college, very polished. Uh, you might compare him in terms of readiness to where Chris Bryant was around this time of his career. Uh, hard to predict and say well, he's going to be Chris Bryant, but I think that overall polish of the bat, the high level of competition, of course, at ASU, uh, he sees a lot of high-quality pitching in the Pac-12 all the time. So I, I would say that for, for Torkelson, he probably is the best pick right now. And plus, aside from the fact that he is close to being a major league ready bat, it's also where the need is. And you hate to say that you're going to take the number one overall pick based on need uh, with your particular roster, but it's hard to deny the fact the Tigers have a very pitching heavy system. And certainly taking Riley Green, he is a high school pick, so a little further away from the major leagues. There is that spot, I believe, in this organization for a close to the majors ready impact bat. And uh, I've, I've mentioned this stat before, Art and Daniela, about the Tigers and, and the overall history of, of them over the last 20 years or so, even, and even longer when it comes to developing position players. Uh, it's not been an organization that has had a lot of position players uh, be star level players, arrive in the major leagues as homegrown players, and then stay. The, the stat that I've mentioned before, the last homegrown, drafted, developed Tiger position player to make multiple all-star teams with the Tigers was Travis Fryman. That's a long time ago. So I think to, to find that next generation of player, uh, I really think is important for the Tigers and Torkelson could be that person. So we've touched on the prospects that are in the system and what we might do with that first overall pick in the coming draft. But the Tigers actually had some really good off-season signings as well. They've got CJ Cron, they've got Austin Romine, they've got Jonathan Scope and Cameron Maven that could really add some hitting power to their batting lineup there. What did you make of these additions to the Tigers? Well, I like the moves, and, and certainly when you think about Crone and Scope, they played together with the Twins, uh, signed basically the same contract uh, with the Tigers to come to Detroit. Uh, two players that are very familiar and comfortable in the American League. Certainly Romine, same thing. His brother was a Tiger. Uh, Austin has played a lot against the Tigers over the years as the Yankee. And I think all three players, all four players, really, when, when you include Cameron there, all respected veteran players who have a lot of experience here uh, around the major leagues. And I think will supply 
some very solid offense and also just leadership. I think for a, for a young team that's in transition, you need those types of players that have been around, been to the playoffs in every case. Uh, all, all four of those players have done that. So I think there's a lot to like about what experience they bring. Uh, the, the veteran nature of that club, I think, is going to be really important to have as part of that group. But I think Scope and Crone, two guys that you could really see hit 25 home runs or more based on their track record. I know Scope has been an all-star before, someone who I really uh, appreciate a lot. His his game reminds me of uh, uh, of Uribe all those years ago with, with the Giants, somebody that would certainly have a lot of uh, big clutch hits for him uh, is Jonathan Scope. So I, I think I like the pickups in a lot, a lot of different ways and give the, the team now a, a new dynamic, some new leadership to layer in there, and we have to see how things play out from there. JP, Dan Dickerson had uh, on Tuesday's show talked to Michael Fulmer, who's recovering from Tommy John surgery. Depending on when baseball starts, it looks like uh, uh, Fulmer might be ready. Can you talk about if he can make a full recovery, what he would add to, which already isn't a bad rotation. You look at Matt Boyd, if jo Jordan Zitterman can stay healthy, uh, you know, Daniel Norris too. I mean, when the Tigers acquired Daniel Norris and Matthew Boyd uh, in, in the trade with Toronto for David Price, Norris was the star. I mean, Norris was the guy that everybody was a little bit higher on than Matt Boyd. And then you throw in, um, you know, certainly uh, Nova, who they got. And, you know, I, I like Turnbull too. So that rotation could come along uh, pretty nicely, especially if Fulmer's healthy. It's a great point. And I think, too, in this division, uh, we're, we're seeing some teams that are in a bit of a transitional phase. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the Indians look like this year, uh, given uh, some of the moves they've made. Uh, and so I think overall, you look at the competition, what the Tigers can bring with the rotation, and Fulmer certainly being an all-star caliber pitcher when healthy. Uh, Boyd, I would say the same thing. A little bit of a tough second half for Matthew, but I think he'll bounce back this year. I, I'm with you, Art. I think that you consider where this club is overall and, and, and what's going to be asked of this group. When, when the veteran pitchers arrive and whenever this season begins, we'll have to see, obviously, the developmental time that's lost for, for the younger pitchers that are, that are probably going to be in Erie and, and Toledo, mostly Toledo, uh, that, that really you're asking these veteran pitchers to give you the best they can for as long as they can. Maybe it's two, three months. Maybe it's longer than that. And so in some cases, there could be the possibility of trades. There could be the possibility of call-ups. So I think that the issue is that eventually the calendar – will move forward, Art, and the pitching will get better because the young players are going to develop. So you're not asking necessarily some of these veteran pitchers like Anova to be a rotation mainstay for five or six years. That's not really what's being asked of them right now. It's, it's about bridging the gap. And if you think about a healthy Fulmer, Nova with all of his experience, you think going back to the Yankees, uh, uh, what he has been sort of earlier in his career, there's a lot to like about this group. Turnbull, I, I agree, came, came on, and I thought was very impressive uh, in, in some flashes last season uh, when healthy, certainly especially early on in the first half. So I think you combine all of these factors together, and, and you're now at the spot where you don't have to ask five people to do something that they've never done before. Just basically do what you've done in the past, whether it's Boyd or Noritz, uh, certainly in the case of, of Fulmer when healthy and Nova as well. Do what you've done before, and then we'll see how the younger players mature. And Scooble is such a promising left-hander. I, I love his story uh, coming in from Seattle U and, and what, he has, what he's done there. I think there's a lot of really intriguing aspects of, of, of these, uh, these young pitchers that are coming in. So I, I'm, I'm curious to see how things look for the veterans, but then knowing that in the back of our minds, uh, these young arms are not that far away. I want to switch gears just a little bit. Because I know that your wife is a hospital medical doctor at U of M and at the VA out in Washtenaw County. She's on the front lines. And the reason I kind of, you know, JP, you've known me a long time. So follow me on this one. I know that what you do for a living in sports, and we all want to see baseball and hockey and basketball, and we, we all want to see it come back. But I think you have a very unique perspective because you're in the field of professional athletics for the most part yet you see what your wife deals with every single day. I'm going to ask you to put on your soothsayer cap here. How do you think this is going to play out? Do you see this returning? I, I mean, are we in for a real long haul where sports fans are going to have to get used to maybe not going to a venue or perhaps even, uh, you know, a watch a lot of TV? I mean, 16 million people watch the NFL draft. I mean, 16 million on Friday. That's got to give you an indication that there's a, a craving for it. But how do you think it'll play out? And and again, kudos to to your wife and all and, and all medical professionals. I mean, uh, you know, I just uh, just wonderful, just a wonderful job. And 
uh, you know, I wish her and you, you and obviously your whole family nothing but the best. Well, thanks, Art and Danielle, for the, for the question. I, I appreciate the sentiments, too. Uh, certainly, it's been a, a difficult couple of months here at, at the house, but also we're very proud and very grateful. Grateful that uh, when my wife has gone to work, she's had the, the PPE that she has needed to this point in time, and she's had the support of great colleagues there at the hospitals and, and uh, really seems to be taking on a, a, a real incredible perspective here to what she's doing every day. And, and cer certainly, I think for all medical workers, we know there's a lot of, there are fears, there are concerns, but also a real sense of common shared purpose. So I think for me, it's, it's been a, a lot of resetting things and, and bringing everything back to its most humble and granular nature, which is for all of us that we're citizens and, and family members first right now, and then the professional obligations are somewhere down the line. So on a lot of days, my my most important job is is getting up in the morning, making sure she's got a good cup of coffee ready before she goes to the hospital. And then then I begin my day. I'm doing some shows here and there, certainly with MLB Network and, and radio work as well to, to keep myself sharp. But then my my other obligation is to take care of our daughters. So there's lots of uh, a lot of work at the at the house with with taking care of all three of them and and making sure they're learning and cared for. So it, it's been a juggling act, but it's one that. I feel very blessed to have because it's it's in support of what my wife is doing at the hospital, which is far more important than what we're doing, uh, at least talking about sports on some level. But also we realize to your point, Art, that there is something powerful in that connectedness, whether it's the NFL draft or games, whenever they come back, uh, whether they're fans in the stands or not, uh, if they're on TV and, and there's a way to come together and talk about things that are not COVID-19, which I think has probably one, been one of my biggest obligations as a husband too is sort of getting a sense from my wife, okay, does she want to talk about work today or does she not? Because it's a pretty hard uh, emotional thing for her to deal with every day. And sometimes you do want to say, hey, how did everything go? You want to talk about it or maybe not. Maybe you want to talk about redecorating the house or something totally different that, that you kind of want to just kind of have a different topic to, to be able to get into. So I think we're all kind of dealing with that same emotion as as citizens and as family members, no matter what our situation is. And as it pertains to the to sports art, it's interesting because I, I will sometimes – say, hey, you know, maybe maybe I'll be traveling again to cover baseball in this month or that month. And she'll just kind of look at me like you're like, John, you realize <laughs> like what I see every day and, and you, you may need to kind of cool it a little bit. So I, I'm, I'm probably the optimist and she is the scientist. So it's kind of a little bit of a, mm -hmm. uh, a balancing act, I think, for the house in terms of what our conversation is like. But I, I do think one of the key things that was said in the last couple of weeks was when Dr. Fauci said that he could envision baseball coming back as long as there was regular testing and as long as you didn't have fans in the stands. So I think that uh, when he said that, I think that was really a watershed moment for baseball and for sports in general that, okay, if, if it has his blessing, at least from some conceptual standpoint, that there may be a pathway to getting back. So we just take it day by day here at the house and, and, and the girls have given us a lot of joy. There hasn't been a whole lot of, there's, not, there's like zero boredom over here. I've got I've got three kids to try to educate and, and feed and try to keep them engaged and happy. So uh, there's been no, no part of this that's been slow or boring or anything like that. We've been very engaged, busier than ever, and uh, we're just kind of taking that day by day approach. Which, by the way, you really realize that now that we're sort of in this and it's and it's a, a very all consuming life for us all. Uh, that those those cliches that we hear in hockey dressing rooms and baseball clubhouses about daily focus, day by day, not getting too high or low, all those things that we all, we, we never want to hear those quotes, but you know what? A lot of them are true. And I think we're all taking that approach right now and, and uh, being humble about the, the approach and, and just uh, enjoying and savoring uh, the joy that we can find in each day. John, I don't think I could have said that any better myself. Everybody right now is kind of taking this day by day. And oh, so much props to your wife and everybody else that works in the healthcare field that's on the front lines fighting this for us. While we get to sit here and talk about sports, I have so much respect for all of them. So a huge thank you to her personally. And John, we're going to have to cut this interview here, but it's been great. I wish we could have you on for like two more hours to just take up the whole show. There you go. Well, Daniela, Art, thank you so much for having me on, and thanks for the kind words. And yeah, please call me anytime, whether it's Tigers, Wings. Uh, always love talking about our teams, and thanks uh, to both organizations and the Illich family for all they've done to help Detroit through this time as well. Thank you for all of you for what you're doing. Thank you, John. Thank you. And a big thank you to our friends at McLaren Health System for presenting Brush Street Beat. They present this episode this week and every week here on The Word on Woodward.